All righty, welcome in. We are gonna get rolling. We've got a jam-packed agenda today and we would love to be able to get through it all and share this information with you. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we are talking diversion in schools, a snapshot. Um, and we'll get rolling. So first we're gonna start off by introducing our presenter team today. So my name is Zoe Highland and I am the education strategy specialist here at Building Changes. And I use she, her pronouns. Passing it off to Sammy. Morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could make it today. My name is Sammy Iverson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am working for Building Changes as a senior manager of education strategy. Um, I'm going to pass off to Kayla. Good morning. My name is Kayla Blau. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a consultant with the Building Changes education team. I'll pass off to Dimitri. Good morning. My name is Dimitri. I am a I work for Building Changes. I use he him pronouns and I am the senior manager of grant making capacity building and building changes. Awesome. Thank you all so, to be in this room with you. Um, so we want to start today with our land acknowledgement. Um, we would like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still inhabit the area today. Um, building Changes, our office is on the land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. Um, maybe just popped a link in the chat. So if you could please enter into the chat, um, kind of you can introduce yourself. So add your name, your pronouns, your role, and um, what organization or school you're joining from today, as well as who's Lance. Um, we would love to see who we're in the space with. Um, so a couple housekeeping things that um, we've been doing this for a while, so it's probably not new. Um, if you are seeking clock hours today, please be sure that your name on uh, Zoom right now says your first and last name as it is in PD Enroller. Um, this will be very important when um, OSPI um, contact over there is taking attendance after this training. Um, I will be sending them the list of Zoom people. And if your name wasn't typed in, we'll have to do some emailing to confirm you're there. Um, so. You can do that by using the three little air, or three little dots at the corner of your image. Um, and then for PD and Roller, there will be a survey through PD and Roller to get clock hours, whereas everyone else, we're gonna do a survey monkey survey, um, which I hopefully can get that link in the chat here um, for you to have to fill out after the training, but have um, now. Please be sure you're muted when not speaking. Um, take breaks as needed. We will have one break in the middle today. Um, and then I am going to be sure that the transcript, or live transcription is uh, enabled. I believe maybe it is enabled because I'm not seeing the option. Could someone confirm for me? Are you able to turn on live captioning? I'm right, not seeing it. I'm not seeing it in the options. Okay, I will continue to problem solve that. I apologize that that is not ready and up already. I don't know where my normal option went. So we'll get there. Um, and then use reaction buttons as we're rolling through today. Um, we love seeing little hearts, claps, thumbs up, whatever emoji you want to pop in the corner. It really helps us stay interacted or helps us feel like we're in a room with you all um, as best we can. We're actually just on our computers. Um, feel free to pop questions in the chat. We'll respond as we can, um, as well as um, you can raise your hands. We'll have a couple Q&A pauses throughout, so feel free to raise your hand and unmute. We'd love to hear your voice. Just some really quickly going through kind of who we are as Building Changes. Um, many of you may have been with us before. Um, Building Changes is a nonprofit working with and alongside communities across Washington State to explore the intersections of systems serving young people, students, and families experiencing homelessness. So some of our work involves funding innovative ideas, providing technical assistance and training, project and program research and evaluation, and advocacy efforts um, to change policies to strengthen implementation. Um, racial equity is the, at the center of everything we do here at Building Changes. Um, here's our racial equity statement. Um, it is also on our website for you all to look into more. And I want to click on to the next slide. 
because um, we find that it's extremely important to center this work and our trainings today um, with the understanding of there are six out of 10 students experiencing homelessness that are students of color in Washington state. So if we take the 2018, 2019 numbers, so we're going pre-COVID pre count, um, that's about 40,000 students, over 40,000 students experiencing homelessness in our state. Um, and if 60% of those students are students of color, then we are really seeing a disproportionate impact on those students, right? So we really need to make sure that we are centering, um, yeah, centering the needs of our students of color. Um, we use, uh, so our focus on equity and targeting strategies for students of color is absolutely vital in stabilizing our McKinney Central population and will benefit all students. A um, little bit of how we got to this training today. Um, we are excited to be partnering with OSPI to um, offer a huge training series. So we've got seven topics and we're offering each of them four times. We were doing it last year, we're doing it this year, um, and we will be offering a bunch of trainings this year. So come join us. We've got a bunch more coming this fall and we will be doing them throughout the spring, too, winter and spring. And a quick look at um, what our day is going to look like. We're going to go through kind of what is diversion that brought you all here today. Um, we'll have our awesome guest speaker from Way Home, Washington. We'll give a quick example of what a diversion conversation can look like. Um, we will take a break right after that, and then we will learn more about how how does this interact with schools? What is, what is this idea? Um, we'll hear from a school district, Bethel School District, that has actually been implementing diversion. Um, and then we'll go into some breakout rooms to connect with each other. Um, here are our learning objectives. Um, and then we are going to do a quick Mentimeter. So if uh, you've been in trainings with me, I love these. Um, so please, there's going to be a link in the chat. Click that link and then you can see, um, so I don't know why Max from Mentimeter is talking to us this morning, but that's fine. Um, click that link in the chat, or you can put in the code here to talk about how familiar are you with diversion. This is kind of a fun, a fun new way to see them. I haven't seen these dots yet, Sammy. Good choice. So it looks like we've got we've got a mix of, of all around. We're skewing a little bit more towards people who have heard about diversion or haven't heard. Um, and now we've also got some folks who are utilizing, have been to a training, or have worked with folks using diversion. And I think it's I love starting our trainings with these questions to really show that we have really a, a wide variety of experience in our rooms and we want to make sure that we're able to hear from you all as well so if you are one of those folks that um maybe has been utilizing diversion understands it well or has been to a diversion training and you you have something that you want to add please please do this is a, a sharing and learning space together all right i'm gonna as much as i love the dots i'm gonna move to the next slide Passing it on to Dimitri. Hey everyone, yo, that Mentimeter was just right because uh, it's really exciting for me and I know the rest of the building changes team to see how that distribution of uh, folks who know about diversion is because we think it's really something that's applicable um, to su support our young people and our families across the um, across the spectrum and experiencing housing instability. So thank you for sharing that and hopefully this will be a meaningful presentation and help that. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about diversion and give kind of an overview um, so that we are all on the same page of what we're talking about when we think about diversion. Um, and we've got lots of wonderful guest speakers and ways to unpack that um, when thinking about uh, young people in particular and in the school setting. Uh, next slide, please. So um, from jump, diversion we think of as a, a fast, creative, um, problem-solving approach to help someone to end their housing crisis in a way that works for them. Um, uh, we found that uh, although diversion might not work for everyone in housing crisis, that it has a really significant impact in helping to restabilize um, many people in their housing crisis um, when used. Uh, 
Um, and we'll talk more about this, but uh, uh, just for everyone to know, if it's not clear, we at uh, Building Changes and many of our partners uh, in community, including Away Home and some of our McKinney Vento leads have found that invested in diversion because uh, the benefits that it can have in our homeless response system um, we talk about it, it being a equitable strategy in an inequitable system. Um, I like to think about this from two perspectives, a system perspective and a practice perspective. Uh, so I'll touch on both. From the system perspective, we know that in Washington state, we don't have enough homeless resources to serve everyone who needs um, help. Um, and uh, so we have to be thoughtful with what resources we have. We also know that because of a history of structural racism, bias, and just how our systems, who gets to call the shots in our systems, um, that when there are scarcity of resources, we tend to prioritize um, our people in power, tend to prioritize uh, who gets access to those systems. Um, and so uh, when this happens, we find that, especially in our homeless response system, BIPOC folks experiencing homelessness can be left out. Um, so uh, we think of diversion as an equitable strategy rather than a universal strategy, because it's based on the idea that everyone is different and should get what they need. Um, and the diversion conversation helps to build trust and center the person in, so in order to talk about getting what they need. From a practice or a person kind of centered perspective, uh, diversion is really a conversation that happens. It's strengths-based and it's focused on creative problem solving that again, puts the person who needs support in the driver's seat. We aren't trying to fit people through a checkbox to determine what they qualify for. We aren't trying to pass them from service to service because we know this can be really re-traumatizing. And we really aren't uh, using our bias to pass judgment and uh, gatekeep resources uh, under the uh, excuse of policies and protocols. So diversion breaks that down by slowing down an interaction um, when someone's looking for help and moving into a problem solving mode. Um, in this way, we've been really invested in how diversion puts some key principles into action, especially working with BIPOC communities, um, young people, and people who have generally been mistreated by systems. So we think about it being trauma informed. Uh, a good diversion conversation only takes out what absolutely needs to be talked about. And once you find the important pieces, you work with that person to figure out what's the right next step. Uh, we think about it as being flexible and nimble because people are complex and their problems they're navigating are complex. And diversion recognizes that and tries to meet people at rather than uh, you know using prescribed solutions, fitting them through a checkbox. And finally, as I mentioned before, it's grounded in critical race, uh, critical race theory. Um, we recognize that bias, particularly racial bias, is present in all of our systems, including our homeless response system. And the idea of people getting what they need uh, is actually a really radical tactic that disrupts how structural racism impacts um, uh, where people get access um, and the outcomes that they, they have in, in getting access to resources. Um, so we'll talk more about this, especially Sammy, but I think that these principles are really aligned with whole child approach, which y'all are leaders in. Next slide, please. So what is a so we wanted to give some background and, and actually show what a diversion conversation looks like. Um, and we'll have a video later on to actually see it in action, um, a piece of it. But a diversion conversation is a nonlinear interaction, which is really based in hearing someone's story, um, staying present, and being very, very curious. Curious so much so that you're making the other person be curious um, and explore. Um, and so I wanted to note, especially the first bottom few steps in diversion, because these are the um, really key parts of the relationship building. It's really based in listening, um, because we know that listening can flatten a power dynamic and build trust, right? It's very um, vulnerable to seek help, especially from people in systems. And so this trust building allows someone to show that uh, the person helping them is there to walk alongside them as they figure things out. Um, and so we think about the basic skills in, in, in good listening, right? So the um, body language and the nonverbal communication is really important to demonstrate that you're present when you're hearing someone's story. Um, we'll see a lot of, uh, in diversion conversations, summary is a really important skill because it demonstrates that not only are you hearing the story, but you're making sure that you're understanding things through that person's lens. Um, it's really important, uh, doing summary helps slow down the pace of the conversation 
so people can uh, express every important detail um, and interpret those details calmly um, and not be reactive, right? Because a crisis, we go into our lizard brain, our amygdala, and it clouds our ability to problem solve. Um, uh, and this is where we can do problem solving really effectively. Um, finally, uh, we use a skill of asking powerful questions. This is where the curiosity comes up. So a powerful question is a question that allows uh, someone to, uh, it, it promotes some uh, creative thinking. It's still in the place of, uh, we still want to be in the place of understanding the world through that person's experience, that empathetic place. Um, but we also can be in a place of impartiality so that our distance from the crisis allows some solution, find, you know, us to find solutions. Um, that's that's where we uh, work to draw out the skills and resources that a person might not realize they have at their disposal. Next slide. I'll, I'll take a break for um, questions. Uh, and yes, we do have some resources around uh, powerful questions. Um, so next, uh, uh, really briefly, I wanted to touch on uh, why we think about building change or why building changes thinks about diversion being effective. Um, we think about it uh, not just in terms of outcomes, which is generally how our homeless response system looks at uh, our, our, our interventions, whether or not they have effective outcomes. But we also think about that uh, effectiveness and the benefits. We need to think about racial equity, um, how it's impacting rates of homelessness amongst some communities, um, and also how some populations are, are experiencing the, the thing. Uh, wow, lots of texts blowing up right now, team. Kind of distracting. Um, so how people are interacting with uh, our system uh, or with our systems, right? Um, and so uh, when we think about diversion, uh, we know that there are certain disproportionalities that um, are existing within our homeless response system. On the left, you'll see, especially for American Indian and Alaska Native folks, they, uh, they represent a small population in Washington state, uh, kind of G, uh, total, um, but a really significant population of those experiencing homelessness. That's the same for the Black African American community. Um, we have a really uh, powerful way to understand um, uh, why this is happening. Uh, the general narrative is that folks become homeless because they're poor. But when we look at data, we actually see that rates of poverty and rates of homelessness across race and ethnicity um, are actually different, that uh, 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 communities of color actually experience homelessness at higher rates than they experience poverty. And we think about that because of this really powerful idea around network impoverishment. Uh, network of impoverishment is this idea that when one person in, is destabilized, it impacts people um, uh, that they're connected to. Um, for communities of color that have been connect, uh, that have had, haven't had access to um, generational resources and wealth, uh, this means that uh, when that person you know, experiences a job loss or there's um, healthcare debt that they have to uh, deal with that really impacts their, um, their economic situation, um, then others around them are destabilized. And so um, I wanted to bring that into kind of perspective because we think that uh, when young, when people, com these communities are destabilized, um, they might need just like that quick problem solving ability um, to engage with their, with their challenges, see their resources, and then hopefully uh, get access to some flexible assistance if they need it to resolve their situation. And so this is a little bit of how we think about being more equitable in our homeless response system, re recognizing that some solutions uh, uh, are not equitable, but they're really based in supporting really um, kind of the experience of, uh, of some communities over others. Um, what else do I wanna say? So um, on the right, we've recently had some really uh, uh, an amazing opportunity to explore how effective diversion is, um, especially for families of color. And we found some, uh, we did this in an intensive statewide study and we found that um, uh, it vindicated a lot of why we're, we're invested in diversion. So we found that all families who access diversion were more likely to exit to permanent housing compared to other services. And also we found that families of color were more, more likely to exit to permanent housing when compared to other families of color that accessed other services. Um, we found that families of color who accessed diversion were no or more or less likely to return to homeless, uh, return to homelessness after accessing diversion compared to other housing services. Um, and so we also found, I think the really important thing here is that, um, that families of color found, chose diversion because it met their needs. So this reinforces the other really important outcome we like to talk about in terms of 
uh, how people are experiencing their services, right? That's a piece of being equitable. Um, so I recognize this is focused on families, but I'm so glad that we have Anjali here to talk about how Away Home Washington has applied diversion in a really effective way for young people in particular. Um, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be pretty brief in my next slide and then I'm, I'm done. Uh, we'll open for some quick questions. I did wanna touch a little bit about how our homeless response system is organized. Um, for almost 30 years, uh, HUD has required that communities organize themselves into what we call continuums of care and to be strategic in how we deliver services. Um, our core functions in, in our COCs, our continuums of care, are organizing our outreach, intake, and assessment processes so that people can be matched with the right resources is what we think about in terms of coordinated entry. Um, to allocate root funding and resources to a continuum of housing services, so from emergency shelter to transitional housing to permanent housing and permanent supportive housing, and also diversion and prevention and to conduct the annual point in, time, point in time count, which is a snapshot in time to understand uh, the need in community and inform how to allocate resources. Um, so in Washington state, we have six continuums of care, um, five that we call our system um, demonstration grants in Clark, King, Pierce, Snohomish, and Spokane County. And the remaining 34 counties are really convened by the Department of Commerce um, as the local authority uh, and they, they uh, uh, govern their continuums of care locally um, between different agencies and community action councils and county government officials. Um, so what's really if, uh, important to see, and then I'll shut up, is that um, uh, we actually know that there are, are components of diversion all throughout the state and all these COCs throughout our state. Um, and that, uh, you know, communities are really being thoughtful of integrating diversion um, as a resource. Um, we do know that there's a limitation in accessing flexible funding, um, which is just one side of the coin of the creative conversation of diversion that um, uh, we think is really important as diversion, as, as building changes. Um, and so I'll ask, uh, if you want to learn more about how we at Building Changes have helped to support communities in uh, uh, implementing and uh, delivering diversion services, um, uh, Sammy's going to put a link in the chat to a study we've done about some of our opportunities to do that. Um, and I'm really excited that we have Anjali representing Away Home Washington here because Away Home Washington has been really incremental in uh, building a best practice around a centralized model to get, get access to flexible funding when a diversion conversation happens. So um, I'll be happy when we can pass it on to her. But um, do we have... That was a lot. Do I have a minute or two? I think I have a minute or two for questions. There was one question in the chat, and I think Sammy kind of sealed it a little bit. So Marilee had asked if we have data around gender-based disproportionalities, and um, I'm not sure, Dimitri, if you know off the top of your head if we do, um, or if that's something that we can connect with her on later. Around gender-based disproportionalities? Um, as in, uh, in in access and outcomes. Generally, we see that our homeless response system um, uh, have um, uh, more people um, who identify as women. We have limited kind of data based on kind of the spectrum of gender identity, but more people who identify as women are accessing our homeless response system. Um, I don't have um, an understanding of specific outcomes in particular, um around that and so that might be something we can follow up on um but yeah i'll say that awesome maybe other people on the bc team have a better answer than that that's yeah. a great answer <laughs> one of the focuses that we you know uh because we focus at building changes on families um and youth and young adults we recognize a major like constituency and major community in this family component are really particularly um, uh, women uh, who are the head of households for their family, um, sometimes who are, are singularly heading their household. And so uh, we definitely know that there's inequity in the experience of being a woman, a gender non-conforming person, um, uh, a gender non-binary person um, in accessing our services um, and the kind of drivers to homelessness are particularly acute. And so that's one way in which we, we engage that. Thanks, Dimitri. All right, feel free to continue to pop questions in the chat. Um, we are going to welcome in Anjali, and I'll pass it to Sammy to do her intro. Yeah. 
So we're super lucky to be inviting um, a partner and friend, Anjali, um, to join us today. Uh, she's going to be sharing a little bit about diversion from a community-based organization perspective. Um, and I also dropped the link of the organization she's representing today, um, Away Home Washington. Um, her title is Prevention and Diversion Training Manager. And um, we're just feeling really lucky um, that she can be here today and share some of her organization's work around diversion, how it's helped end homelessness for young people across Washington state. So welcome, Anjali. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, as Sandy said, I'm the Prevention and Diversion Training Manager at Away Home Washington. I'm actually fairly new to Away Home Washington. I just started in May, but I have nearly 10 years of experience working with youth and young adults that have been disproportionately experiencing systems of oppression and homelessness. Um, I've been working in employment services, drop-in shelters, um, and the job training programs. Um, so with the homeless, and I'm sorry, my four-year-old is homesick, and so he might, he's next to me right now. I apologize in advance. Um, with the Homelessness and Prevention Diversion Fund, which I manage, we are pushing ourselves to figure out how to house someone by tomorrow and meet your urgent needs to prevent homelessness today. That is why we designed a flexible, low-barrier, youth-driven fund, uh, or solution fund model by eliminating those uh, bypassing, or excuse me, by eliminating and bypassing barriers in the system like referrals and wait lists, we can move people along a continuum towards housing stability faster and more efficiently. All right, next slide, please. Away Home Washington is a statewide movement to prevent and end unaccompanied youth and young adults homelessness, specific uh, homelessness. Specifically, everything we do is working towards a Washington state where every young person can access the service they need and want quickly without having to leave their home or community and see them stably housed as a result. Our Anchor Community Initiative, which we refer to as the ACI, takes on a very specific role in creating a yes to yes system. We, with the ACI, we're working intensively with four, soon to be eight, anchor communities and counties to reach, reach a functional zero um, for youth homelessness. We're doing this to provide proof points that at the state level and at the state level that ending youth and young adult homelessness and sustaining that end is possible. We value ending, not just responding, justice to end homelessness. We need to end disproportionality too and data. We need to know our impacts and have real-time ability to pivot and learn from those data points. All right, next slide, please. How we use the diversion model. Exploratory strength-based conversations to brainstorm practical solutions for people to resolve their experience of, sorry, excuse me, people to resolve their experience of homelessness and quickly, safely outside of the homeless system. Focus on helping people to get past the immediate barriers they face in obtaining safe housing. Generate creative ideas to identify realistic options for safe housing. Housing options are identified based on a person's own available resources rather than those of the homeless response system. Our goal is to become, is to have the person housed right away within about 30 days. And then we also hope that this will be a one-time financial assistance when needed. However, people are able to make requests again if, if they do need to. All right, next slide, please. Uh, the flexible prevention funds can be used to eliminate a barrier to housing, create a new opportunity for housing, make existing housing safer or more tenable, resolve a conflict that was threatening housing, and result in a client being housed permanently or temporarily outside of the homeless system. What I love about Away Home Washington is that we really do explore creative solutions. So it's, it can be something as simple as paying a past bill. It can be something as helping with um, like, if plumbing's an issue, we can help with plumbing to make it a more stable place to live. Um, we've helped with car repairs. We have helped with really creative things that's gonna prevent somebody from falling behind in their rent or not being able to 
um, maintain their current housing. Uh, we help a lot with like eviction notices and things like that. If um, there's something that we can solve to immediately respond to that need. Um, what I love about it is that there is no wait time. Once the request is made, it's about three days of processing that check. And then um, again, the housing solution conversations that we have at Away Home Washington is will this person be housed within 30 days with this resource? And that's what we go to. So generally any anything we can think of, the point being is will it result in housing in 30 days? Then yes, we can do that. We can provide that fund. The, there's no particular limitations and we get really creative. We can help with pet fees. We can help with various things that's gonna help keep a family together. All right, so next slide, please. So the, our beliefs and underlying diversion, everyone deserves housing. People have deep wells of resource and potential. Not everyone needs an entire suite of services to be housed. People can be housed outside of the system. People need and want different things and have different perceptions of what housing will work for them. Again, I would say that this is my favorite thing about flexible spending funds is that the perception of what housing will work for a different person or family or different dynamics of how people survive um, needs flexibility and needs the ability to be responsive to um, not just the cookie cutter solution one size fits all. Um, Rejects the idea that people experiencing homelessness are the, in the position due to a fundamental flaw. So again, it's not the individual's fault. These are um, the symptoms we see of systemic oppression. We as service providers don't actually have all the answers. That's another thing we really challenge is really working with a young person or their family to understand what, what they need and what their answers and solutions may be that we can help guide the process between. It's not necessarily that we're gonna tell them what to do and that we need to actively center justice. These beliefs, we need to, we need to center these beliefs in diversion. Um, they are justice-centered. They're youth-driven practices that eliminate the barriers and systems rather than recreate them. So I wanna say that again, because I kind of stumbled through that. Um, Diversion needs to be justice-centered, youth-driven, and eliminates the barriers and systems rather than recreates them. We need to challenge the status quo and the systems and programs we work in if we're actually going to end hom youth homelessness. All right, next slide, please. As I mentioned before, we keep up-to-date live data of our work and how the funds are being accessed. And I'm just gonna drop the link in the chat this is our public dashboard. Um, you can also slide for various different um, socioeconomic demographics. You can adjust to the dates to see how our funds are being used. Um, and in the past six months, we've housed 163 young people and their families across our anchor communities. Again, those anchor communities right now are just Walla Walla, Spokane, Yakima, and Pierce. The top three uses of our funds right now has been rental assistance, housing deposits, and transportation, which also includes relocation. All right, next slide, please. Okay, this slide is from our Walla Walla case study. Walla Walla has significantly reduced the numbers of youth and young adult homelessness, as well as they are closer to reaching functional zero, meaning and meeting their county's goals by the end of 2020. So they're so close, we're almost done with the year. And what this tells us and what Walla Walla has shown us is that prevention and diversion really does work and that there, it is a solution to end homelessness and it can be done. All right, next slide, please. So having worked across homeless services and programs and in various school programs, I'm so amazed by the creative and responsive solutions that are flexible, easily accessible and youth centered with a diversion approach. And as we continue this work, we must center justice and services, honor strengths, explore possibilities and be creative. And I just wanna say thank you so much for having me today. It's been a pleasure to share my passion about youth and young and adult homelessness prevention and diversion. And I just wanna end it strongly with ending youth homelessness is possible. And um, feel, I'm gonna drop my email in the chat as well. If you have any more questions about Away Home Washington or how the Anchor Community um, Initiative works. And thank you.
Thank you so much, Anjali. Um, we have a couple of minutes for folks if you have questions for Anjali about the Anchor Community Initiative, diversion, or anything that you heard her share today. Um, we've got a few minutes. And while folks are thinking about that, I do want to own a few uh, tech blunders of mine this morning. Um, we are hosting this Zoom meeting on a different Zoom account than I usually do. And I did not check in the like, big settings if I had enabled transcripts and breakout rooms. So fun things today. I have not been able to enable auto transcription. If that is a problem for you, please um, message me directly and we will come up with a solution together. I apologize. That is not accessible, as well as um, we're going to pivot in our breakout rooms at the end. So bear with us. Any questions? All right, looks like we have a question in the chat asking specifically King County diversion funds. Um, do any of our presenters or Anjali know? Oh, okay. Yeah, we got yeah. yeah, I could jump in on that. Um, yes, uh, there are diversion funds available in King County for sure. Um, our partner, so I'm, I'm, I think we were really gracious to have away, Anjali and Away Home come. Um, uh, because they have been really thoughtful to um, use this centralized diversion fund model and apply it to communities that often don't have a lot of resources uh, across the state and have been really effective. Um, in uh, King County, we have a partner, Africatown International, that helps to operate the what we call the King Africatown International Centralized Diversion Fund. Um, and currently there are, are resources available um, especially for families that are experiencing homelessness um, and housing instability uh, currently um, that are accessible. Um, I should have mentioned, and um, I'll find a, a way to pop this in the chat, but we are having an, uh, trainings, uh, actually one next week and uh, the following week on the diversion approach. Uh, and that is um, the first step to getting authorized to access the centralized diversion fund. And then finally, kind of the purpose of showing how our homeless response system is organized is, um, especially in King County, uh, uh, many of our mainstream uh, kind of homeless um, service providers uh, do have a quote unquote diversion program embedded in them. So they are um, uh, intended to use diversion as an approach uh, when they're engaging people um, and sometimes have resources uh, connected with um, with doing so. And so um, I hope, um, especially later today, when we hear from uh, Echo and Danny, uh, uh, the thought is, you know, if, if our homeless response system is, is, is primed to do that, um, we need to work to bridge the important work y'all are doing um, in schools to know that you can partner alongside our homeless response system uh, to, to make sure that a young person experiencing homelessness can, can get access to diversion. And actually, here I'll, I'll pop up uh, in the chat the centralized diversion fund um, for our African Town International. So, folks, especially in King County, can learn about that. Thanks, Dimitri. I also want to highlight um, a question that Echo had in the chat about direct cash transfers. Um, and Sammy um, was able to say we have been we have done some work with uh, the impact of direct direct cash transfers, specifically that came up at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we're hoping to do more of that um, in the future to be able to show how um, positive an impact that can have. All right, any more questions right now? And otherwise we'll continue forward. Africa Down International is, is led by two wonderful people in our community, um, uh, Malachi Kane and uh, Yolanda Lissende. There's, a, there's another Africa Town in our King County community. It's, it's Africa Town Community Land Trust. And so oftentimes there's a little bit of kind of confusion on, on who is who. I'm popping in the chat um, some details on the Centralized Diversion Fund. And then I will also pop in the chat um, if folks are interested in the, the incoming uh, diversion trainings. I just, I mean, I have a, can I prompt a question, Joey? I mean, for folks, so we got some good response around folks' awareness around diversion in their community. Um, did what has been shared between Anjali and I, Anjali and I um, vibe with folks' experience or understanding of what 
diversion represents. And um, especially because, you know, one thing about diversion that's interesting is that um, it's a, we're looking how we're thinking about how we can put, as Anjali put so wonderfully, like justice into action, recognizing that not everyone needs the same thing. And there are like historical reasons why homelessness looks how it looks. And our systems in leaning into racial equity are really are really wrestling with that. So I'm curious to know, especially from folks who have like you're doing this in in the in the education setting, um, uh, if if it seems if if that is how you've heard about it or been exposed to it, or if that seems like constructive and meaningful um, for work that you're doing. I do find that meaningful in, in the um, in the sense that not every uh, not every one solution works for every family or individual. Um, sometimes we I have experienced um, youth who have varying uh, guardianship situations, and their immediate need for for shelter is not the same as another you know youth who um, is living or you know has um, no prior foster or court type of situations. And so, yeah, the, the need can vary case by case. And so having a, a resource that is there that's able to address those um, is very useful. That's I'll awesome to hear. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I'll chime in too, that this is really helpful for me to learn um, just the, to name this process of, um, of a diversion conversation um, and just understand, like, I feel like because the resources have been so limited over the years as a school social worker, I've found myself doing this anyways, like coaching a family through exploring their own resources, you know, knowing like, okay, we're really limited on what we can find in the system. And in the meantime, let's talk about what, what resources you have, who do you know, you know, what relationships are strong in your lives right now and just thinking creatively. So it's nice to learn that there's a name for that. And it would be fabulous to find those um, pots of money that can be used creatively um, so that if somebody just needs a, just a one-time use of funds to solve a really, tan you know, particular tangible problem um, that could make all the difference, it would just be nice if those funds were available across the board. You know, it'll, it, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that grow. I love how you said that there's, it's cool that there's a name for that because one thing that I love on my education folks is like, y'all understand, especially when working with a young person that, you know, they are not the sum of their crisis and that we can help them build skills and work through things. Our homeless response system, I think sometimes has forgotten that and chosen to be more prescriptive in how to support people. I just wanna jump in really quickly. We're gonna be presenting a little later, so I don't wanna you know, say too much right now, but I, I do think that a lot of us are, are already doing this work in some capacity or another. And just one thing that I kind of wrote down while Dimitri was talking was just don't beat yourself up over the skills. They will come with time and rather build a toolbox of resources and tools that will help you feel comfortable implementing di diversion services and think of it as a practice and a process rather than like a program. Like, you know, you're already doing this. You're already having these intakes. Maybe you need to implement some more questions or, you know, have some more active and listening and summarizing skills or whatnot, but we're already doing this work or, or maybe it's our counselors and social workers at the school level. So we can dive more into that, but there's somebody that's having these conversations. So how do we take it and run with it is what I'm thinking. I'm loving this conversation um, and thank you for everyone who has unmuted and added into the space today and also popped into the chat. Um, Marilee, I did see a few questions you had in there that we weren't able to get to in this question pause, but don't worry, we will have more. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're actually going to watch an example of a diversion conversation. Um, I can let Dimitri uh, preface it a little bit more um, while I make sure I'm sharing my audio and visual correctly with you all. 
Thank you. Um, uh, so we wanted to give a little snapshot, right? So we can we can get we can talk about talking for a long time. If you don't see it in action, uh, it's hard to really contextualize that. But I just want to say to Echo's point, like y'all been doing this, so there should be no surprise um, around what this looks like. It looks like those first three steps I've mentioned in the active listening, the summarizing, and really holding space for someone because they're in um, a moment of crisis, right? And so that's a really vulnerable space. Um, and so keep that in mind and we'll have some kind of prompting questions afterwards. This is a tool that we actually use in the diversion training. We'll only show the first five minutes, but it's a um, kind of a, an example um, of, of how a diversion might look like, especially in our homeless response system. Uh, the folks you see, I, I love dearly uh, in this video, they're both our, uh, two of our diversion coaches that we use, so leaders in diversion in our community, um, Karen Taylor and Dwayne Parker, and they've give, given permission to share this. Um, and so take a look, look back, um, uh, think about those first three steps, especially like how the interaction is going and what kind of problem, what active listening looks like and what um, problem solving looks like, what kind of questions are being asked. All right, I'm going to hit play and um, give me some thumbs up, thumbs down feedback. It's uh, it's working. I don't think we can audio. All right, we will take two. It's funny how you click these buttons and then you hit share and then it doesn't do it. So we'll. All right. Um, take two and actually give me verbal feedback because it just made the videos go away to optimize for this video. So air high fives. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. So um, since we're six feet apart, is it all right if I take this off? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, why are you here today? My friend told me you guys have some housing. I've been having a hard time out here. I just got out of prison. I'm trying to get some housing. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming in. Um, I know that, you know, coming out of prison is hard. So um, let me do the best I can to help the transition as best I can. Um, let's look and see what we have uh, that's available for you. So um, first and foremost, can you give me some details about what you're looking for? Well, um, I want my own place somewhere in Seattle. I'm born and raised here, so I want to want to stay in Seattle. Okay, good deal. So you're mm -hmm. looking to stay someplace in Seattle. Um, is there a specific area that uh, you're looking for? I want to stay in the Central District because it's being gentrified, and I just want to stay there because my grandparents used to live there. No, I understand that. You have history there, and you want yeah. to stay where your history is. Yeah. And the Central District has been gentrified a lot lately. Mm -hmm. So I do understand you wanting to stay in uh, your spot that you were born and raised in. I'm hearing that you're wanting to stay in the Central District, um, and you are dealing with coming out of prison just uh, a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask, do you have any um, sort of income at this point in time? or? Um, I, well, I want to get on SSI. And, uh, I want to get some mental health therapy. I've been uh, staying with my stepfather, and um, you know it's just not working out because he's uh, like a sexual predator, and um, you know he just keep doing little offenses that that are uh, that are offensive to me, disrespectful, and it's like um, you know like walk around in his underwear, stuff like that, just weird. Just like why are you doing that? So it's like I gotta get out of there. Um, it's been really uncomfortable, and I've had thoughts of harming him. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to go back to prison. So I really want to um, find someplace decent, one bedroom or even a studio that I can stay in. Mm -hmm. All right, understandable. First and foremost, let me give you uh, props for coming out and and. Uh, reaching out to figure out your own solution because I understand that with your family situation and uh, being in a household with somebody that you're counting on mm -hmm. and them you know abusing that privilege um, is is very stressful so I'm going to give you props for coming out and looking for a space that you can get of your own so that you can be safe and also as you said uh, do the right thing because mm -hmm. if, if you're thinking of harming them uh, that wouldn't go over well for you. So, nah, you know, and I got a record, so I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to go back. You know, I've had a rough life. I've had a lot of uh, 
situations of abuse and um, in my life, um, you know, and I, it's just, uh, you know, I'm just, I guess I'm just angry. I have a lot of anger because I didn't deserve to be treated like that. And so, um, even as a child, so, you know, and he, you know, he started in on me when I was 13, you know, so uh, it's been going on for a long time. He molested me and my younger sister. Um, so, you know, it's just, um, I'm not trying to be locked up. I don't want to be locked up. I didn't like how I got treated in there. And so I want to do everything I can to try and uh, get some housing. I believe that I deserve, um, you know, some fair housing and uh, sustainable housing that I can, uh, that I can call my own and so I can take care of myself and not feel like I have to commit crimes. Yeah. And I agree with you, you do deserve some fair housing and you are worthy of getting some help from the system. Um, and and I, I am so, I'm not gonna say sorry, but I, I'm, I'm very glad that you were able to share with me um, your situation and that you're doing the things that you need to for yourself to get straight. Because um, I understand that this is a bad situation you being in. Um, dealing with, you know, like I said, going home and having your parental figure treat you in a way that is not good for you, period. And so you making that decision, I mean, because it sounds like this has been a long history in your life. Um, yeah. And you making that decision to move away and and get on your own and, and look for a better solution is great. And I'm going to give you a lot of props again for that. So um, today we're going to make sure that you are in a safe situation so that you don't have to go back to that. Um, can I ask, are you, are you still in the home right now? All right, I'm gonna reshare my screen with some questions and Dimitri will lead us through a little group discussion. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Joey. And, you know, I know that that's just the taste and actually get um, really challenging because actually there was, it was getting evocative. So the video goes on for another uh, five or, you know, five or so minutes um, of the conversation. And again, like this is a tool we use in training. Um, but for today, we just want to kind of, uh, again, uh, a glimpse um, and ask some, some things in terms of what folks saw. So what do people see? What are folks' initial impressions? Um, I'm happy to go first. I can't see my screen, so um, bear with me. Um, I, I was really impressed by the summarization. So everything that was said was repeated back, but mm. in, um, in a meaningful way. So that was impressive. And that's something I'll take away, I think, for today. Why, why, why did summary stick out for you as something that was important? Because then um, the person was heard because I know that me someone presents me a problem and I go into okay fix it how do I fix it what tools do I have what can I do um, yeah. really uh, I think it's a lot more helpful to be present to be with the person to hear what they're saying they know that I've heard what they've said and then I also can process what they are actually needing yeah. and not just go right into my brain <laughs> yeah thank you uh, some good uh, observations in the chat, body language, compassionate listening, relatability, empathetic. Um, so both physically demonstrating, uh, Dwayne was physically demonstrating that he was present, um, uh, as well as uh, kind of living into some of this compassion. Um, I, uh, someone noted, uh, Rusan noted that um, Karen was affirmed, um, demonstrating that she was worthy and deserving of respect, um, support, and help. Uh, and there's no, and Monica mentioned no judgment and she loved, you deserve help from the system. So kind of stating these things. Um, thank you. Um, definitely responding to how Karen was treated. Um, what other act of listening, the skills were observed or, or seen? What, what else was Dwayne demonstrating? We have, we have a few, definitely like reflection, 
uh, and being present. He gave her space to tell her story. Yes. Thank you, Danielle. That's exactly right. Right. Um, uh, there were opportunities where Dwayne could have um, been like, oh, you're out of jail. Um, oh, we actually work with, uh, you know, I, uh, my colleague works with formerly incarcerated individuals. Let me sign you a referral and I'll send you over to them. Um, but no, there was a moment where uh, she, she expressed that Dwayne used that as an opportunity to ask another question, a powerful question to draw out more of her story um, in a thoughtful way, right? Um, it's funny to actually observe Karen's demeanor. Uh, she comes in, she's a survivor clearly, and can, can survive well on her own, like a lot of our, the folks we're working with. Um, uh, and then also, you know, it's our role sometimes to help push people beyond that, <clears throat> just survive, that's what our coaches talk about. We just can't have them in, be in survival mode, right? In that amygdala crisis response mode. In order to actually be creative and thoughtful and hear the whole story um, there, uh, you have to kind of push them or I shouldn't say push them actually, you have to create space for drawing out more of what happened. What's, what's the background behind that? Um, again, something that I think y'all do brilliantly in schools because you, with young people, uh, at least in my own experience, like you get the one word answer <laughs> and nothing's more off base than just the one word answer. Um, so thank you. I, th I think the last question I'll ask because I think we're running out of time um, and I'm loving the stuff in the chat. Um, uh, how was problem solving approached? Um, or maybe another way of, of asking that is, um, uh, how, how, how did Dwayne ask questions? There was a lot of acknowledgement. Yeah, I think that that's a really key technique um, to, to affirm, oh, you've done some thinking about this. Totally. Any other thoughts? Anyone want to come off mute, be brave? How is problem solving approach? Maybe a question is, um, who was guiding the solutions? Or who seemed to be guiding the 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 place in terms of solutions and how do we know that anybody okay this might again this might be something y'all are doing naturally it was really that curiosity piece right so i had mentioned in that stair step you know there's the powerful question the powerful question is not just, I mean, sometimes there are questions, you know, there's the closed ended questions we talk about, especially with young people, open ended questions, right? Closed ended questions, you get details, open ended questions, you hear a little bit more. So there's that, those sort of questions. And then there's being curious. When you're able to be curious, um, you're, you're showing some impartiality, you're showing that distance from the crisis to, to hear, you're being empathetic, but to hear about the full situation. Um, and then exploring some different kind of pathways that might go down with that. Um, what really helps in being curious, again, going all the way back, those, going up and down those steps uh, is definitely the active listening skills. And then the summarizing, because uh, you might be curious, but uh, you, uh, in summary, you're giving an opportunity to be like, um, actually, that, um, the person to correct, them, correct you and be like, actually, that's not really the uh, way I'm thinking about things. Um, that's not how I'm, uh, what, what I'm geared at. Um, and so it allows you to be curious in a different way. Um, so that's kind of what I, what I, what I see. I see some brilliant things of genuine, Shannon said, genuine curiosity is disarming. Most people don't regularly feel heard. That's true. That's really true. Um, his questions were open-ended and he was really looking for what was important to her and what she wanted to need. Absolutely. Um, I think I have to, I have to move on. Um, mm -hmm. but. Um, thank you all so much for kind of engaging with this exercise. Again, um, uh, if y'all are interested in training more deep and seeing how this plays out, um, uh, definitely we would like to support you in getting that. Thank you so much, Dimitri, and everyone who was thinking about this um, example. We are going to move into a five-minute break. Um, please return at 11.05.
I'm also going to drop the link to the post uh, training survey monkey. Um, so that way you can pull it up on your screen now and then you have it for later after the training. Um, so I will see you all at 1105. All right, I'm gonna invite everyone back. It is now 11.05. Um, if you are back at your desk and are able to turn your camera on so we know you're here, please do that. We love to see your beautiful faces. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Sammy.
All right. I just have to say, um, I am like super excited about the engagement and excitement we're seeing around um, diversion today from you all. I know there's a ton of um, school folks present and it just like, um, it really lights me up because um, I did work as a liaison for a couple of years in a district and it was, um, it was a time when I was hoping to see this energy. And um, in that particular district, it just was very much like, we don't have capacity, you know, we can't pull this off or we're not interested in that right now, or it's, it seems like too much. And so like the genuine, just like thirst for this is just bringing me all the joy. So I just wanted to say, thank you. Um, this little section is really gonna focus on bringing those pieces together, right? So diversion as an asset to school housing partnership, um, on this next slide, we just really want to think about what it looks like if you're able to work with partners, housing partners, any really community partner that can bring resources to students and families. It really invites capacity and additional supports for those students and families um, in your community and can be um, really hard to see at times when you're focused in your role, um, when you're feeling like you're at capacity. Um, this happens on both sides, both your school side and your housing side. So this slide is really wanting to focus on how we can align our intentions because um, they exist across our systems. It's already been brought up in chat and through conversation um, that these are things a lot of folks are already doing. Um, and if you think about it between the school and housing systems, I want to bring back those four bullets that Dimitri raised earlier, okay? So trauma-informed care and person-centered care. So that really translates just, <laughs> I also have a little one. Um, that really translates well into school language, such as student-centered. We hear that very often, right? Um, I always make jokes about how my son always knows when it's my part, because he just like shows up. Um, so it's also, Diversion is also really fast and flexible. We know that you know schools through their McKinney Venture liaisons, um, they have a right to immediate enrollment, um, right to transportation, right to participate in all school activities, where we don't always have extreme control over what that looks like um, in our roles as liaisons. Um, what we know is that we want that. We want that urgency to be there. Um, also, this is gonna be exploratory and not prescriptive. Um, sorry, it's turning up over here. Um, so exploratory, not prescript prescriptive. Um, schools really have that every student, every day focus. So they know the ins and outs of students' lives. And they know that what's not helpful is saying, I need you to do this, or this is what you should do. And then at the end of the day, the most important one is that these services are equitable and anti-racist. So anything that we can do to focus on being inclusive, specifically centering students of color, um, we know that there are challenges that are unique. These students that we really need to come in and support whenever we possibly can. Um, we're gonna hear a little bit next about trauma-informed care. Thanks for weathering that mini storm with me. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy, and thank you, Luca, in the background. Love the passion. Um, so when we're th thinking about on the school level, right, of multi-tiered systems of support that we already use in schools, uh, Divergent can be braided really well with this already of that, that tier three of students and families that need extra support or interventions. Um, there are a bunch of models here in the link I'm going to put, I put in the chat about how this can be woven into things that you're already doing at the school building, like in those MTSS meetings and those tier three meetings, how diversion can come alongside and support. Um, next slide, please. So we know at this point, trauma-informed care is like a huge buzzword, so I won't you know, go too much into it, but it's backed by brain science and contemporary psychologists. I would totally nerd out with y'all about that if we had more time, but that voice and choice and having agency over your life for people that have experienced trauma is a huge component in their healing journey. Um, that, that choice piece is so countercultural to what our traditional case management system asked us to do, right? But as we've you know, heard over the course of the training, it feels really different when you know, traditional case management is like, here's a phone number to call. 
that number might be out of service. Uh, that number might lead you to like, you know, a whole roundabout of being passed from person to person. And that can really isolate and um, turn folks off from asking for support. That feels different than a warm handoff if I'm like, okay, I'm gonna connect you with my friend Anjali at Away Home Washington, and she's gonna walk you through X, Y, and Z to support, you know, the goals that you have identified. So one tangible way that, you know, diversion can be a trauma-informed way of approaching things is, and I know, you know, there's familiar names in the chat. I know a lot of y'all already do this, but having those provider meetings of building up that network of support already so that you know who's in the community, you know, as far as services go and can just have a warm handoff off instead of, you know, calling when there's a crisis and getting the roundabout ways of how our system works of all the obstacles. Um, so calling those provider meetings in your community can be a really great way to just build those relationships on the front end so that you're not um, asking someone who's already in crisis, already had a, has experienced compound trauma to go and navigate that themselves. I'll pass it back to Sammy. So again, bringing back that flexibility and sense of urgency. Um, these bullets are really just gonna cover a couple different pieces that I know that I saw show up in, in my past work, as well as kind of working with others across the state focused on student homelessness. Um, we know that housing crisis is really stressful um, for folks, for the people experiencing it especially, and it can also be stressful for the people showing up to support them. But there's limitations. Um, we know that the school districts and the housing providers often have, you know, hours of operation and where we can try to work outside of those. And we know that a lot of people do. A lot of times it's not possible. So just thinking about how these crises, they're not in a container. They just happen and that we can do our best in our roles. But sometimes having those partnerships in place can extend that workday or those hours that were available to people. Um, role definition and resource sharing across schools and housing providers, it really helps that access piece. So it helps think about how we can get students and families to what they need as soon as we can. So if you have those relationships that Kayla is referring to in place, um, it's just a lot easier, it takes a lot less time to get a student from point A to point B in terms of what, um, in terms of what they need. Um, also just acknowledging on both sides, capacity limitations are real. And um, in that kind of tune of building capacity through partnership, um, if we don't, like I always think about the things that I've tried to take on on my own, like wanting to wear all the hats, right? And it involves like, I have to do this side research and figure out where this resource is. If you have those um, relationships in your community, it's, it's really a lot quicker and a lot easier to just say, oh, you know, I got to kick you over um, to Kayla. She's totally like all about that resource, all about being able to help in that way. And um, I think we heard from Anjali that's really promising and exciting um, with the Way Home Washington work that these flexible funds do exist out there. It's not in every single county across the state like we would love to see, but um, and there's definitely a built argument for why this is so important. And um, I would just urge you all, if you're feeling connected to what you're hearing today, that um, to explore where those flexible funds might not exist, might exist around you, because there's a possibility that there is a version program, maybe it just hasn't been accessed yet. Um, I've seen that um, really incredible curiosity that we talked about. Um, the next slide is really just a photo around or graphic around centering equitable access for students of color. Again, um, I want to keep saying I know that a lot of this expertise is already in our room today. But um, Part of this, the biggest piece really is acknowledging that need to be anti-racist, acknowledging that need for equity, and taking into account and prioritizing how to meet the needs of students of color. So trauma and racism are real, and students hold many identities, which is kind of what I was trying to get at with this graphic. Really, it requires a huge range of supports and services. Um, next slide. This Again, is another way to represent the previous graphic in terms of kind of what forces are at play um, when students of color are in need of support and are experiencing housing crisis. Oppression exists at all levels of the human experience. So this is not just like a single layer, I'm having a bad day. 
this is layers and layers of individual, interpersonal, institutional, and structural weight that that student may be carrying when they get to you to have this conversation. So just to think about how to make that time, slow down you know, and show care um, and show understanding and show respect in these, in these really important moments. And then the last slide that I'll share with you today um, in that exploratory, not prescriptive tune, um, I feel like um, this is a really strong group in terms of advocacy. Like I hear people really standing up for students and their needs and meeting them where they're at and really seeing students as individuals. But um, what I also know is that uh, people run into, students run into things that make this crisis harder. And um, the two things I'll highlight today are going to be adultism. Um, this graphic, it's a hard, it's a little bit hard to see, but the circular one says obey me minions are, you know, it's a little bit cheesy, but when we think about adultism, we know that it refers to the bias or discrimination adults and social institutions demonstrate against young people on account of their youth. So if you've ever experienced something that was challenging and someone said, oh, you'll know what, you know, you'll figure it out. And that's really not that big of a deal. And you should probably just, you know, maybe go home and talk to your parents about it. Or as a young person being told like that you don't have agency or that you don't know what you need, it doesn't feel good. And what it does is it really breaks that trust that you're trying to build with students, specifically in this work on accompanied youth. So wanted to highlight adultism. And then I just thought this was a really powerful graphic around um, white privilege. Um, this is not intended to, we don't have the time to dive deep into this, but I just think that even we can, we can have the best intentions and we can still impact folks around us in ways that we aren't always aware of. There's a million different reasons how and why that happens. And a lot of them are because we're doing this on purpose. But this graphic, if it's hard to see, I just want to run through them really quick. Um, White privilege means, um, your parents know, oh, excuse me, that was the wrong part. White privilege means when my child turns on the TV, they see lots of people who look like them. Um, means my child has never had a teacher single them out because of their race. My child has never been the only one who looks like them at a birthday party. If my child scrapes their knee at a friend's house, they'll get a Band-Aid that matches their skin. And then I can allow my child to express difficult emotions like anger and frustration without worrying it will make them unsafe. So those are just some things to think about in your approaches. Think about how you are um, showing up for the students that you're serving. And then just to kind of drive it home, um, diversions in schools working together they can reinstill, build trust that individuals know what's best for them and their families. Um, version intentionally will slow down um, to be more mindful of where students and families are within their crisis, bring support to help them realize their own solutions. Um, you could see an increased capacity through sharing the work. And um, diversion in schools working together can help students and families of color feel included, seen, and centered in a system that historically has not served them. Um, what we're going to pivot to next is um, we are really, really, really um, fortunate to be welcoming some lovely people, Echo and Danny, um, to speak a little bit about uh, diversion, their experience um, applying diversion in schools. And um, you've heard Echo pop in already and Danny in the chat. So they are activated advocates and I think we're so excited to have them here with us today. Welcome in, Danny and Echo. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all just have each other's faces. Yay. Um, we'll just start with some quick introductions. My name is Echo Abernathy. I'm the McKinney and Foster Care Liaison for um, Bethel School District, and I've been in this role for about three years, um, but um, have worked with youth in many different capacities, youth development capacities, boys and girls club, just a lot of different roles. So I think it was all building me up to this point. Hello, happy to be here today. I'm Danny Stanford. I'm the other McKinney Mentor and Foster Care Liaison for the Bethel School District. 
Um, I've been in this role about five years. Um, and prior to this, I was an elementary school teacher in the district. So first we're gonna start by just telling you guys a little bit about Bethel and um, just kind of how, how we got into the space of really implementing diversion into our everyday work. So um, Bethel is a huge district, it's 202 square miles. Um, there's no city municipalities in our area. We are mostly rural and suburban. Um, so that brings up some interesting dynamics in terms of our community. We don't have like any YMCAs. We don't have any community centers. There's no shelters and there's no hotels that are located in our district in those 200 square miles. Um, there's only three miles of public transit that run into our district and limited sidewalks in a lot of areas. Um, most of the services and shelters are located in Tacoma and Tacoma is about 20 minutes outside, uh, 20 minutes away from us, give or take. Um, it's the largest city um, that's close to the Spanaway area. Um, last year, we qualified about 700 students for McKinney Vento and our largest categories are the doubled up category and unaccompanied youth. Um, so we just say that to, to say that um, it is possible for both, you know, large communities, large districts, small districts to really implement this work. And it does take time, but um, we know that you can do it. And um, we just want to share some of the, the things that we've learned along the way. Um, so kind of talking a little bit about, you know, the steps to implementing and doing diversion. So some of the things that really stood out to us while we were kind of talking and preparing was um, just really making time like you are today to learn and complete training. You know, um, it's so important that you're hearing it and you're hearing again, um, you know, the different skills that you should be, you know, either, you know, building upon or implementing into the work that you're already doing. Um, we've attended a few different trainings, which helped us to really grasp the concept and see, you know, what we were doing well and where we had um, opportunities to grow. Um, we participated in the Creative Conversations diverting, Diversion Training that was offered by C Catholic Community Services um, and um, are in the process of becoming certified as Community Homeless Resolution Partners. Um, so we would be in partnership and we are in partnership with Catholic Community Services. There's a collaborative there. We meet once a month. We talk about what's going on, not only in the student-based homeless system, but um, just in, in Tacoma and just we talk with a lot of partners in general about the work that they're doing. And then we hear from different service providers and we're, we're, we're always gaining like little tips and tricks on what we can implement or maybe who we should partner with. Um, we also were lucky enough to attend um, the um, national conference, the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Um, that conference was in July in Washington, DC. That was super dope because we were able to connect with a lot of different service providers that weren't necessarily in the school world. So that gave us kind of a different lens on how, on how this diversion was being implemented outside of the district and outside of kind of our lane. So it was really good to go to that training. We just did that this summer. Um, and then also, I have also attended the Away Home um, Washington training on um, diversion as well for youth. Um, and so it's super exciting to kind of hear the different perspective and lenses. And again, the main point of that is just that it helped us to really hone in our skills and hear it again and again to make us more comfortable. Um, other steps that we kind of implemented into the process was just building partners with CBOs, so community-based organizations, and um, having conversations with them about implementing diversion services into our program offerings. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of, you know, building those relationships with community-based organizations, but um, this really expanded, a, allowed us to expand the resources that we offer to evaluate our program and to fill gaps. Um, we've partnered with organizations like Building Changes. We've done ABC tool work, which has been phenomenal in helping us to identify areas where we can grow, giving us ideas on people that we can partner with. Um, we've partnered with the Reach Center, Catholic Community Services, um, Bethel Community Services is a kind of a main uh, CBO that helps us with a lot of our, um, our flexible funding and multiple churches and donors. And I think that churches are a great place to start, even in smaller communities. Faith-based organizations are really aligned with a lot of the work that we're doing. They want to help people. They want to help with housing solutions. They want to help people with basic needs. So it's a great place to start. Um, and then also different um, shelters as well. We've partnered with some shelters that are outside of our area because we do need to have uh, those shelter options for our families and students, even if it's not in our district. I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to Danny to share a little bit. 
All right, so um, some of the, how do we use diversion in our district? Um, so one of the main ones is it's just woven into our intake process. Um, so in our district, um, we qualify and conduct intake interviews at the district level. So that's ECHO and I. I know other districts, sometimes it's done at the school level. Um, but basically, we just use those, those diversion strategies in our intake conversations. Um, and it was interesting when we first started our diversion training, you know, it was kind of like that aha moment, like, oh, we're kind of already doing this, you know. But the takeaway, like someone said previously, that it was also a good reminder, like, okay, because you do tend to want to jump into, okay, let me fix this for you. Here's what you need to do. And so it was really um, impactful to hear strategies how not to do that and to really create that space to let um, your families and students you're working with kind of drive those conversations um, and sit back and really truly listen to what it is that they need um, and help partner with them um, to come up with solutions. Um, so when we do our intake interviews, um, you know, we use those strategies, those open-ended questions, um, uh, repeating back what we've heard. Um, and so, you know, really we're just meeting, we just try and meet the students and the families where they're at. Um, and so I always try and let the family steer the conversation. Um, there are a couple pieces of information I need on my end in order to make um, the making an event of qualification. Um, but aside from those little pieces, I let them take over the conversation um, and just kind of tell me what their story is and what it is they need and, and what they think might be good solutions are. Um, and so sometimes, you know, the, it's interesting because the conversations are always, um, they really vary, you know. Sometimes families don't want to open up as much and it's a pretty short conversation. And sometimes it's, you know, a much longer detailed conversation. But again, it's just meeting them where they're at and trying to support them and give them that space to um, to share with us their situation. Um, and so um, one strategy that Equ and I use is we always take good notes and we have a shared document between each other. Um, so that way if I'm speak, working with a family, I'll take good notes and she will have access to that in case she ends up speaking to this family down the road. Um, and we found that that's really helpful in that we're not making these families share their story over and over and over to someone new each time. You know, we're already on the same page and know how we can um, support them. Um, so how do we utilize this type of funding? Um, basically, um, we, we use it for both long-term solutions, for example, in ways to get them into the permanent housing, but also to meet immediate short-term needs. You know, again, it goes back to meeting them where they are and what they need at that time. Um, and so something I think is kind of important um, to point out is that when we are using our diversion type funding, um, it's not necessarily strictly housing related or strictly education related, um, but basically it's, it can be anything as long as it supports the overall well-being of the student, you know, looking at the big picture and, you know, if it's something that's going to contribute to their overall well-being and in turn contribute to their overall success in life, um, we, we'd love to be able to help in that area as well. Um, so some ex quick examples of things we've, we've used um, our funding for and things that have come out of these diversion conversations. Um, as Echo said, we don't have any shelters in our area and we have very limited public transportation. So getting to shelters outside is tricky. Um, so we have partnered with a local church who is a safe parking site, meaning that people who are staying in their cars can come park in a secure area and have access to facilities and be able to get connected to other resources. Um, so we were able to help contribute um, some financial assistance to the safe parking site because they do directly work with our families and they were able to expand their lot so they could hold, have more people stay with them. Um, driver's Ed, that's one of those um, examples of it's not necessarily directly tied to housing or to education, but it's, it contributes to their overall success. It's a life skill they will need. We've been able to help out um, with a couple of driver's ed classes, um, hotel stays. We try and be really intentional about um, providing hotel stay, a couple nights stay in a hotel. 
Um, and, you know, because we know it's not the fix, it's just a Band-Aid. So we wanna make sure um, that there's a meaning behind it. Um, for example, I, I spoke with a family yesterday um, who just found out they have to leave where they're staying on Saturday. They have no idea where to go. Mom, you know, was super overwhelmed, hadn't had a chance to look at what resources are available. Um, and so I asked her, I said, well, wh what would be helpful? You know, would a couple nights to kind of get on your feet and have a place to think and kind of get a game plan going, would that be helpful for you to write right now? Um, and she said, yes. Um, and so it can be kind of buying them time. So they have the time to access resources um, and come up with that game plan. Sometimes it's, um, you know, just a, a stopgap, you know, we have a family who recently, um, they knew they were gonna be able to get into a shelter in a couple of days, but they didn't know where they're going for, you know, until then. So we were able to help come alongside with another organization and help cover that stay so that they, they would have somewhere to go until they could get into the shelter. Um, we provide a laptop for youth who was um, participating in a Running Start program. So we're trying to support, you know, not only his current high school education, but post-secondary um, ambitions. Um, basic needs, um, you know, with, with our more flexible funding, we, we really try all, again and be intentional about, um, you know, the different funds we're using to be able to meet these needs. Um, and we do have grant funding and we do have Title I funds we can use sometimes to help basic needs, but sometimes we need things right away. Um, and it goes back to what Sammy was saying earlier about being able to provide things in a timely manner. Um, and so it's super helpful when you have flexible funding to be able to meet those needs right away. Um, move in costs, again, this is one that we really try and look at what the need is. Um, we don't provide move in costs for everyone, but if we do have a family where it's just, you know, a, a fairly small amount that's holding them back from getting into housing and that's literally all they need to be able to per be permanently housed, then we'll help out with that. Um, and then the last, the last, um, example I have that I think it's important to think about is sometimes we can help out with when our families do get into housing is helping them with furniture because we know with the insane costs it takes to get into um, housing that it's usually taking all of their money and so we really like to be able to support them once they get into housing with things like um, furniture bank where they're able to furnish their home um, and so that way they still feel supported because I know we, we focus a lot on our families who are, you know, currently um, experiencing homelessness, but it's also important to continue to support them, you know, even after they're, they are housed. So just a couple examples of how we've used it in our district. Sweet. Good job, Danny. It's, it, it's always exciting to just hear again about all the great work. And sometimes I think when you take the time to reflect on it, you're like, man, man, look at look look at all of the great work that we're doing and all the lives we're changing. But to kind of talk a little bit about how um, using diversion has impacted our students and families, um, and we've kind of talked about this throughout the training, the the training. But removing barriers to permanent housing, finding housing solutions quicker, right? So we're just kind of a step in that process, you know. Um, less people for our families and students to have to deal with in this interconnected system because it is very very interconnected all of the work that we're doing right and less episodes of resharing your story and hopefully reducing trauma ptsd and and just those negative feelings of having to like share you know your trauma over and over and over again you know how emotional and how hard that can be for families so if there's things that we can do to help families not have to keep resharing this um, we're happy to do that. Um, taking things off of their plate, prioritizing their immediate needs and long, and sometimes their short-term goals. Maybe we can, you know, there's a bigger long-term goal that we have to connect them to someone else to, but is there something that we can help do along the way? Um, feeling normal for students, a sense of belonging, having access to the same experiences and opportunities and positive memories that other students can have. So one example, quick example of that is a yearbook or going to a homecoming dance. 
we've helped with that because maybe our funds that we have in-house won't allow us to, right? So that flexible funding will allow us to help with those type of things because students deserve those memories. And when I think about on my childhood and how important it is for me to go back into my yearbook, look at the school that I attended, think about the good memories at prom, think about my prom dress and those things that are so important to our young people, that is building on a positive future. That is building on the whole child approach. Um, building the family unit, keeping families together. Sometimes our accompanied youth are separated from their families because they have to be. We just had a family that had a fire and literally they had nowhere to go. So one, uh, this our, one of our students went to Yelm, the other one stayed in the Spanaway area. They were completely broken up. So if there's an opportunity for us to, us to help keep that family unit together, we're definitely gonna try our best to do so. And then really just solidifying the school and community partnerships that whole child approach. We're really, you know, trying to work this solution from all angles. What, what can we do to be a part of the solution in addition to the provisions that we are, are providing to every McKinney-Vento student? Um, what tips do we have for, and I should stop, Joey, how are we doing on time? Um, we're doing great. I would say a minute or two more and then maybe open it up for questions. I do see one in the chat, so continue on. Sounds good. Um, what tips do we have for um, schools looking to bring diversion into their districts? Um, start with finding community-based organizations who understand who you serve, where your service gaps are, and opportunities to provide more resources. That could be shelters. That could be working um, with different churches. Um, that could be, you know, working with food banks, right? Because you're going to need different partners for different things. So those are the community-based organizations. Attend trainings. We talked about, about that offered by OSPI, building changes, uh, Away Home Washington, and other community-based organizations or coalitions that are working to address homelessness. Because everybody's coming from it with, you know, coming from different angles, you know, and stuff. So you can incorporate that into your work and then you can tap in and partner with them as needed. Um, obviously our focus is student and youth homelessness, but it's also helpful to have an understanding of the whole system and what supports are also available to adults, DV survivors, because a lot of times this is the parent or guardian of your student, right? All interconnected. Um, and it's important to try to support the whole family to the best of your ability because it will improve the overall well being of the student. We can support the student all day, but supporting the entire family unit is what's really going to move the, the needle and possibly change the outcome of the situation. So that's just kind of some tips. Um, and then I think lastly, what we have here is we, we, we anticipated a couple of FAQs. So I'm just going to kind of talk about um, how do you connect with the partners? Start with faith leaders. I think I mentioned that um, churches are almost always willing to help support. Um, survey the area for nonprofits who are hoping to partner with schools. Tap into part non, you know, partners you're already working with. Kind of tell them about the needs that are arising. Um, uh, I know there was a question about like grant flexible grant fundings. Where where is it coming from? Um, we've worked with building changes on some different you know streams of funding through our AB tool, ABC tool work. Um, we've got partners that you know hold funds that are like you know what we want to you know dedicate this amount of money to host health stay specifically. So you know reach out to us if you have a family that fits that situation. Um, just looking for grants. Um, you know, if there's grants that are that are a little bit more flexible or maybe for a different need, um, that's another opportunity to, to build on funding. Um, but really finding a, a community based organization that's going to align with you and that's going to help to support those needs as they come up and understand, you know, what what you need and what your families need, I think is kind of um, oh, answering that question. Um, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions because I feel like we've done a good job of kind of covering the basics. Thank you, Echo and Danny. Um, I just, again, I'm always so so impressed and amazed by the work that you're able to do, um, the creativity you bring to it. Um, I um, want to just answer one of the questions in here about what is this ABC tool work? Um, so ABC tool is this um, exciting thing that we've been working on at Building Changes. Um, Danny and Echo have been um, part of our, our pilot in that work, um, as well as Mary Lee, who's in the room here too. Oh, and I think Shannon, we got a couple of folks in here who have uh, been through this with us. Um, so it's a really exciting tool that we're using to um, 
uh, help schools uh, assess and then build capacity. So looking at your uh, McKinney Vento programming, kind of your, your school system um, as it serves uh, students experiencing homelessness. And um, we have this big spreadsheet tool that we kind of go through different focus areas and talk through um, kind of different uh, strategies that can be used to um, better support um, your students and families. So that is a partnership that we've been in um, with a couple of different districts. Um, we have been able to offer some flexible support dollars um, through that, um, through those opportunities. Um, and we are looking forward to expanding our ABC tool work. So um, there, we do have um, an opportunity to partner with a few more schools over the next year. Um, so if you, that is something you may be interested in, please email me directly and we can chat a little bit more. Um, and yeah, that's, that's ABC tool. And it's something we're hoping to like really get out there soon. So this is a sneak peek to uh, what we're talking about with that. Um, do other folks have more questions for Danny and Echo and how they have brought diversion into their district? I was just reflecting on, uh, you know, a couple other pots that have come in. We've partnered a lot with the Greater Tacoma Community Foundation. Sometimes we'll see grants that are specific to unincorporated Pierce County. We're in, we're in unincorporated Pierce County. So we'll see grants that are specific to rural areas that have a little bit more flexible funding. Um, so those are kind of some other sources of, of funding that, you know, we've been able to receive. A lot of times what will happen is, is, you know, we'll, we'll have our CBO, you know, apply for the grant and they'll hold the funds. And then when we need to access it, we'll work with them and say, okay, this is the family, this is a need. And then that's how the funds will be allocated. So the CBOs, a lot of times will hold those funds and they'll be the ones to kind of help us connect the family to that resource. Looks like there's a question in there from Mary Lee about if Bethel is connected to TPCHD. I cannot claim to know that acronym. So, hi Joey, Mary Lee here. Um, hello all, Echo and Danny. Good to see you. And before I ask my question, just great work, great work. Loved your presentation. Um, and some of this we do naturally, but I think it's important that we do it intentionally and strategically. So thank you. Um, my question was um, whether or not Bethel or a, a part of Bethel is a community fo a focus site with Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. In our world, Joey, TPCHG just rolls off our lips, right? You know, pretty quickly. Sorry for the acronym, but are you a community of focus site? And if so, how does that benefit you in your work? I believe that we are a community of focus site. We have a family center. Um, we have the Bethel Family Center that's located on the on the campus of Challenger. And I believe as I think, and this may be more of a question for, for my supervisor, Jay Brower, but I believe that we are and that that funding helps to pay for a part of the position for our family center coordinator. So um, as a focus site, it is directed towards the family center. And the family center is also a hub for our families to access different resources, to access different partners. So that specific pot is going towards the family center and funding the coordinator that manages that program as well. But we're all in the same department. So we're kind of in cahoots. We totally get that. <laughs> Same here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking that. I think it's super important that we, you know, we brought up that you brought that up and just the importance of the family center as a physical space where families can access resources to where we offer additional classes. So um, it's great work. It's partnering at its finest and it's happening in our department and very close in our community for families, not only McKinney, Vento and Foster, but families throughout the community that need support and resources. So thank you for bringing that up. Heaven forbid we'd be involved in prevention discussions of homelessness, but uh, thank you. All right, we've got another minute or so with Danny and Echo before we're gonna move forward. Um, I do wanna highlight Monica gave a really great example of um, in thinking about intentional partnerships and um, how they reached out 
to community-based organizations. Um, and Monica, if you're uh, interested in saying any more, like we'd love to invite you to unmute on that. I would just say we're in our fifth year, just starting our fifth year, and it took a long time to bring people in and get wrapped around the same initiative, but same thing, um, community-based organization nonprofit holds our flex funding that schools can then access because there's a lot of like barriers to fu accessing funding in, in the education system. So yeah, I could go on all day. So I'll just let you guys have <laughs> your presentation, but um, it's been really great. I always say, you know, it so that makes it feel like a one-stop shop for a family. So they don't have to go, like you were saying, share your story or navigate all these things by themselves. Um, and so uh, it's, I tell people we don't necessarily have a back door into all these programs and organizations, but we have a side door, you know? So we have a direct point of contact for ourselves as well. So it helps serve families faster, quicker. Thank you, Monica. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen again. We are getting towards the end of our day. And I, again, I'm gonna apologize for my tech blunders and we are not gonna be able to have breakout rooms today, which just breaks my heart because I love um, the opportunity for you to get to connect in smaller groups. So instead we're doing a few more Mentimeters and then we'll open up for um, some group share. Uh, so our first one here is asking, how do you see yourself possibly using diversion? in your role. So this is going to be a short answer. Um, and we can drop that link in the chat, maybe. Hold on, I had it. There it is. Um, and we'll start uh, thinking about it. And as people are typing in um, answers, I would also like to invite anyone to come off mute and um, share any ways that you are, you know, thinking of moving forward with some of the information you've heard today. And it looks like we have some results coming in. Oh, it looks like I was on the wrong slide. That's what was happening. So you get, were you all seeing the wrong question? A different one that's on the screen. Yeah, all right. You're welcome to me pivoting live time right now. Thanks for rolling with me. It should be back to this question now. <laughs> Okay, give folks a minute. All right. In the chat, we have uh, Mary sharing that although they're not currently working in a school district, they're glad to hear about this information and it's new. So thanks for being here. And our goal with all of our trainings is to just share information. Um, and hopefully the more folks that we can get in the space across the state, the, the more we can better support our students and families. All right, now I'm just wondering if I'm incapable at using Mentimeter. <laughs> when, we go, when we go to the link, it's still that same question. The, no. uh, yeah, so the what else mm -hmm. do you need to move towards implementing? Um, All right, well then we're just gonna roll with that and we will go to yeah. the question. So, <laughs> Let's um, do it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks all. I, uh, you know, important to be able to roll with it and continue to roll with it when it's still not working. So, all right. So this next, this last question that we had queued up here is what else do you need to move towards implementing diversion in your district? Um, or just any lingering questions that you may have and co-presenters and, uh, other guest speakers, I invite you to, as you see questions popping up or into the chat, please feel free to unmute and speak to them, as well as anyone in the room, please feel free to share what you put on and um, or voice anything else that you're thinking. Oh, here we go, now it's popping in. 
I feel like every time I use Mentimeter in a training, they have slightly changed their system. And it's just, yeah, here we are. So let's see. This one says, I would love to improve my diversion conversation skills. I already practiced this, but I can tell there's room for improvement. If we could access diversion funds, that would help us be more impactful. Let's see. Click on this one more training opportunities with different dates and times. We need schedule options. Also more info on length of the training so we can encourage others to participate. I love, you know, I just want to jump in here, Joey. I love that. I mean, obviously we're in a training, so people here know that training is effective and important, but um, uh, I love the fact that folks are interested in more training opportunity and availability. The two things with that, um, uh, like building changes, we're definitely um, I think part of how we think about systems change is to make sure that these approaches are being done uh, diligently and uh, completely and authentically. Um, uh, and so that's key. I think um, one thing that you, you know we can help use help in uh, that y'all can provide in your communities is saying um, we need folks like there are folks like y'all already doing the darn thing like well. Um, they can be trainers in your community they should be funded by your community to do that work because again it's it's how we make um our systems work effectively um and really we need kind of our our public partners um be it you know ospi be it some of our county leads um to fund that those trainings um for sure uh building changes we're glad to offer the amount of trainings that we can and yet we're still um, at capacity because our initial scope of work is not just training um so also appreciate that and then also i i also if if y'all don't mind since i'm waxing anyway i think that this is a great audience because oftentimes um uh we get lost in the sauce when it comes to um doing the thing doing the diversion and then accessing the funding but i think again y'all as stewards of 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 diversion are really important because um all the solutions that uh, i heard from echo danny and anjali they only become, well, they only become uh, relevant and we understand them visible uh, once we ha do that diversion conversation well. Um, uh, and so there is that, um, that push and pull of access to the funding resource, right? Um, because it is really an impactful trust building piece and then doing the diversion well. So I'm so glad that uh, this audience has a great grasp of that. I just want to chime in and thank you guys for this training. Um, it was just such a helpful reminder about the diversion conversation and um, I'm looking forward to the more in-depth training. I noticed that impulse that we have when we're really bombarded with need and we feel like the resources are limited, that our knee-jerk reaction is, you know, like, oh, you mentioned this word, so you must need I know somebody that has that resource just to kind of solve the problem quickly so we can move on because we've got another person we're also in a, in crisis and just um so to me the takeaway is just to be present and to slow down and really make sure we're listening because maybe our impulse of this you know for the solution is not the right one and um so i really appreciate that message thank you um I'm I I just wanted to say for people, for liaisons, especially in the district too, that sometimes there are seasons of, of more diversion. So our season right now, right now in September and October is identifying and qualifying. I tell families, I, I will listen as much as I can, collect as much information. I have to come back sometimes to have that conversation again. I may not be able to have the entire conversation and do everything that I want to do or that you know mm -hmm. this family is requesting at that time because right now it's about identification and qualification and setting up transportation and immediate enrollment. So we do have to prioritize what we are what we have been hired to do and then also add in these additional layers as we can. So just to kind of echo, you know, what Ann was saying, don't feel like you 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 can't meet every need. So don't go home feeling like I didn't meet every need that this person requested. So I've been unsuccessful because there's a lot of things that 
the even within the provisions of what you provide and those services that you're helping that student and that family so much, you know, but you do have to balance your time and balance your plate and to be to, to offer healthy solutions and to be the best listener, you have to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, this is merely echo I put um, a, a response to what you just said in the chat like you made my day and and uh, especially for those of you not working in schools just the week or two before we start and the week or two after um, I know I was covering more than one position and it just felt like a fire hose of need coming at me so as when you were, as you were talking I was thinking oh my gosh I wish I could have had these individual wonderful discussions with everyone but I also know that if we don't get those transportation requests in it can take five days to get out of district transportation and we are a district here in Sumner Bonnie Lake that we lost our ability to provide free meals to our families we didn't have a high enough community eligibility um, percentage for SNAP or high enough free and reduced lunch rates across the district. So we've just been scrambling to make sure we can get our kids transportation and food. And I think your words are just so well placed right now in this space that, okay, now as we can catch our breath, right? Probably another week or two, but catch our breath and go back and work with our families. So here's my closing question. Um, are you using your building changes funding only or grant funding for um, diversion, Echo and Danny? Um, uh, if you are working with a family that's doubled up due to economic hardship, because I know our system in Pierce County won't allow us to use federal or state resources for families that are doubled up, who have a roof over their heads, right? They have to be literally homeless under that different definition. So do you, do you see diversion and how you're doing it as a way to kind of work around that system? Yes. So, and it goes back to, um, loving having flexible funding because we do use it for those families who traditionally could not access it through other places so yep we we help them all or try to all right so we have a few minutes left um and i want to wrap us up thank you so much for being with us here today um i will add a few more links into the chat momentarily i do want to just highlight this uh this request here for Summer in-person opportunities, maybe we plan a conference. I hear you, I'm thinking about it. Um, we have our monthly school housing network, which um, our first meeting will be on October 20th, which on the next slides, um, we will get you a link to come join us. Um, Sam, we dropped it there. And you know, we'll keep uh, thinking about that idea of an in-person school housing network conference. And that's kind of how I see it uh, possibly coming together. So stay tuned, love the idea. We've thought about it too. <laughs> I was just gonna sneak in really quick to just say like, um, this is a contract with OSPI and there was something in that Mentimeter that said, is OSPI open to more flexible funding? And what I wanna say is that every single person in this room is helping us move that direction. So like your excitement and your sharing of certain situations and individual questions, like every single training that we've given under this contract, we've changed it. So this one that you see today, it will be different the next time that we um, present it. And it's because we're super in tune to feedback. And what we want to do is make sure that your experiences are showing up in the needs um, of for these trainings to change. Um, so I just like I couldn't help but like want to say that right now today because I really, really appreciate we appreciate um, everything that's being said here and, and just want you to know that we're hearing it and that um, we're pushing for that same <laughs> that same flexibility um, in funding in however we can across the state. And um, everyone that's spoken up for students today is, I feel like we're just all so aligned. So just, you know, thank you from me times a million from us. <laughs> I can't uh, second that enough or third that or get yeah. Sammy, that's it. <laughs> Um, a few other logistical things. So if you are seeking clock hours, you will have to submit your survey, your post-evaluation survey through PD Enroller. Um, and once attendance is recorded, that should send you an email saying, do your survey. Um, if there's some weird complications with PD Enroller, please email me um, and we will sort through them. And then um, slides will be emailed out in the next um, day or two. 
uh, come join our school housing network first meeting on the 20th. Um, I will be updating that contact list probably next week so you can get that invite. And then we've got three more trainings this fall. We're going to do a deeper dive based off of um, questions and themes we saw arising in the OSPI training last week. Um, we'll be doing our serving specific student populations and one on data and storytelling. Um, so that's going to think about how are you looking at your pupil services and how are you using that information. Um, and then here's some contact info. Please let us know. Um, yes, if you couldn't get into PD Enroller, please email me directly and we will like ASAP and we'll we'll figure that out uh, together. But send me an email so I can track it outside of the chat. Um, and that is it for our training today. Thank you so much for joining us, for um, participating and for just all the work that you do. And I'm gonna hit stop recording and if anyone wants to hang out, chat, we're here for a little bit. <laughs>